Thank you. Good morning. Why don't we turn in the Bibles this morning to Mark, the 12th chapter, Mark, chapter 12. This is a passage of scripture I've kind of been grazing on, to use Hans's term, for a while now. I'd go, I suppose I landed on this pasture, and I don't know how many mornings I'd go back to it, but I don't feel bad for not reading other parts of scripture, <laughs> you know, when you're grazing in a certain place and you're getting lots from it, you know, and God is talking to you. Don't feel guilty if that's the only place you stay for a while, because you might as well get all the nourishment you can from, from it when God is, is talking to you. So I thought we'd look at this passage right here in Mark chapter 12. Um, starting at verse 12. And then we will look at this whole thing in its context, in the whole area here. Like I say, I started, I hate to use the word grazing all the time, but I started in this little plot here, and I started uh, eating, and I go over a few verses down, a few verses backwards, and find more nourishment. And to see this whole passage in its context has, has blessed me, and I hope it'll do the same for you this morning. Let's start at verse 12. Let's do, let me just say before we start, actually, this is a time toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, toward his life. This passage that we're reading right now is Tuesday before Friday where he was crucified. This is Tuesday. He's got three, left, three days left right here before his crucifixion. And... The enemy is throwing everything at him. The devil wants him dead. And you'll see it in this passage. And somehow I picture this like you see on documentaries, you know, where they're talking about some war or some battle that took place and how they laid plans and they had an arrow coming from this side, how they were coming from there, and then how they were going to swoop around from this side and they'd come by the sea over here. And I see this happening to Jesus right here in this passage. The devil is throwing everything he's got at him. He's got a loaded gun. He wants to get rid of Jesus now. In fact, the verse in Luke, before we come to this passage, you have this same passage in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's, if you look at the title in your Bible, mine says, Paying Taxes to Caesar. And um, they're coming at him from absolutely every angle. They want to finish him off. And Luke says they were looking for a way to kill him. But they couldn't, he said, because the people were hanging on his words. They couldn't do it because the people were hanging. They were afraid of the people. They were hanging on his words. Isn't that what we're meant to do? Hang on Jesus' words? Because if they fail, we've got nothing left, right? What is it that took us out of the miry clay? His strong arm, and we just hung on. It. <laughs> hang on. Hang on. And, and the people were hanging on his words. And, and they were looking for a way. And let's look at this first verse now. And they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Okay, this is just after he had told them a parable. Now we'll look at that parable in a minute, but I want to get the context here. This is the situation Jesus is in. They, they want him dead. They want him dead. They're looking for a way to get him. Now Jesus is in the temple, and if you picture him, they're coming from this side, uh, right here in this passage. You're going to see two crowd, two groups of people that don't get along in normal circumstances, but right now they're allies. They're coming to Jesus. They're going to get him because they, they, he's got no way out of this one. This is a question Jesus can't answer without getting in trouble, so they think. There's no way out. And then right after them, the Sadducees come in with their little attack. And their attack after attack, they think they've got him cornered here in the temple, and he ain't coming out without being arrested. This is their plan. And, and what does Jesus do? Let's, let's look, because that's what's important, isn't it, this morning? That's what, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus have to say in this? So later, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And without going into that for time's sake, let's just, they didn't get on with each other under normal circumstances at all. Totally different political and worldview, but they're coming together to trap Jesus. They wanted to catch him in his words. And this I find hilarious. 
This is just ridiculous. How are they going to try trap Jesus in his words? Now, we know from our point of view, here's the Pharisees, these leaders who are high up in the eyes of men, elders of the people, and the teachers of the law. So they're all the big hobnobs. They're all there, and they're against Jesus. They look at him as being a puny man, when really what's standing before them is their creator, who is called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's standing him here, and they're trying to trap him in his words. It's, it's just dumb. And, and they're, they're, they're going to take care of him. This Because there's no way out of this question. There's no way out. So these two enemies come together to try and trap Jesus. And then they butter him up. And, and they say all the right things. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. This is true, right? You aren't swayed by men. You're not going to give us an answer that we want to hear. You're going to give us the truth. You're not swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So they're buttering them up. You, you know, you don't, you don't care who you please and who you don't please right here. There's two of us here, two groups. You know, you don't, we don't care. You don't care who you please. So they're buttering them up. You're going to give us an answer, and, and then they're, they're going to pounce. This is their plan. He's going to say something wrong one way or another. If he says, yeah, let's pay taxes to Caesar, then the Pharisees are going to get him for treason. And it works the other way. You know, if he says, well, don't pay taxes, then the Herodians are going to go and get an uproar. And either way, Jesus is in trouble. He's in trouble. And then here's their question. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? They're looking for an easy answer. They want simple answer. It's easy. Yes or no. That's all they want to hear from Jesus. But you know, Jesus rarely ever gives them. When there's questions like that, Jesus doesn't give in. He's going to give them the truth. He's going to give them what they need to hear. He's not always going to answer questions. And so here, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we or shouldn't we? Yes or no? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? You can see right through him. He says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin and asked, and asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? So they bring him that Roman coin. On that Roman coin is a picture of Caesar. And he says, whose picture's on that? Well, they answered. Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus answered them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God. What is God's? So my question this morning for this message is called, Whose image? Whose image? Um, he says, he, he looks at that coin. He says, whose image is on that? Whose writing is that on that coin? Well, that's Caesar's. So, well, it's got Caesar's stamp, it's got his picture. So, well, we'll just give it back to Caesar. It is. Don't we do that in, if you invent something, you invent a product, something that goes to, out to the market, everybody uses it. You get a patent for it, right? And then it goes out. And, and, and you get your royalties from that because you made that. Nobody would be using this. Nobody would be getting it. You wouldn't be getting any money if you hadn't made it. But because you've got the patent on it, you've got your stamp on it, it's yours, right? You deserve some of the credit for it. And he's saying, well, give Caesar what's his. That's his coin there. You just, just give it to him. But the most important part and the part I want to look at and the place I want to, to look at is, in, is the, the phrase next that he says, which is, and unto God the things that are God's. I mean, how often we read this scripture and we think it's, he's just talking about taxes. And I think if you look at it in this context, we're going to see a lot more than just Caesar. Jesus isn't here to deal with Caesar. Jesus is not here to deal with Caesar. He's worried about and he's preoccupied with his father's business. He's looking for the house of, of, of God. So the question to us this morning and the one I would like us to take home with us is this. Whose image and whose inscription is on your life and mine? 
Didn't Jesus, God say that in the chat, very beginning of the Bible? He, God spoke and he created. And then he, after all that, he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And so each of us, just by the fact that we're born, have an image stamped on us. It's God's. And as one commentator said, we're more akin to God than we are to any of his creatures. Evolution looks at the other way and says how like we come from and we're more attuned or more like the creatures. <laughs> when it's the other way around, we, we can know God. Uh, he made us in his image. And we're saved or unsaved, Christian or non-Christian, we all bear the image of God. We got the stamp. He made us. He's the potter, right? We're the clay. He's in charge. And he, like I say, he doesn't ever have to answer our questions exactly like the way we ask him. And if you look back, Let's let's look back just a couple of verses, and we'll come back to this. Um, let's go to just a couple of chapters. Let's see, I was doing it in a different gospel now, so I got to find my place. Um, okay, chapter eleven, Mark chapter eleven and verse twenty-seven. Man, it's getting hard for me to see. Um, okay. Now, I said we look at this in its context. Jesus had just the day before, on Monday before his death, or on Sunday, Palm Sunday we call it, right? He rode into Jerusalem riding on a colt. And they're laying down their palm leaves, they're laying down their clothes so that Jesus can go over with the donkey. And he has the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is the setting for all this. Next day, he goes back to the temple, Monday, into the temple, and he cleanses it. He does a thorough job. He walks in there, and he starts chasing out the money changers. I don't, I can't, it's hard to picture this, but there's a lot of people there, and Jesus is getting them out of there, and he's not letting anybody pass any merchandise through the temple. You've seen that, they say that in basketball. This makes me think of it, you know. You have your home court, everybody's all pumped up. The other teams comes down the court with a basketball. They've got their thing. Their main man takes a shot. Big guy from defense there gets up and he just slams the ball back into the audience, back into the crowd, back into the seats. Not my house. You know, you do it, the word goes up, the hands go back, the chest comes out, you know. Not my house. You know, and this is what Jesus, if we can look at it, is doing here in, in, in cleaning out the temple. He says, not in my house. You're not doing this in my house. So he clears it out and listen to what he says. Let's go back a few verses there. And as he taught them, he said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it, made it a den of robbers. So then look at this, and this is the context and, and the antagonism that we see in these verses. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd were amazed at his teaching. Okay, my house. Jesus wasn't out to deal with Caesar. Jesus didn't come into this world to deal with Caesar. Uh, he was about dealing with his house. It wasn't what it was supposed to be. Here is Jesus now, we see the creator again. He made the dirt that this temple was built on, the stones that it was built with. He's standing right there in the temple. He's called it my house. He has it by right because he's architect too. Didn't he tell him in the tabernacle how to build it, where the utensils were to go, where the altar was, where all this sort of stuff? Isn't this his house? He's the architect. They built it and the rulers, the Jewish people, had gone far, far, far from where they were supposed to be. The Jewish people were set apart by God as a nation, at first as an individual, Abraham, God took him, set him apart. Do you see this land? Everywhere you put your foot, that's yours. He's going to start a nation. He's starting with Abraham. Uh, he, he's, he's got something in mind when he goes into this. He's, he's building a nation to propagate his word from which the whole world will hear Right? But in the meantime, he's got to keep this nation pure, holy, and, and have the word of God amongst themselves, but live according to it, and then prepare every child that was born after that 
for the coming of the Messiah. This was what it was all about. This is my house. He says he came to his own, his own people, and they received him not. So here he is. This is it. This is the fulfillment of scripture. He came to his own. They didn't receive him. So he's there. All the people that were supposed, of all the people who were supposed to get ready for Jesus and to know he was coming, the Messiah, the Jewish people. They were the ones to whom the law was getting. In fact, Romans, and he says that, and Paul says that in Romans. He says, what advantage does that Jew have? Much in every way. Was there an advantage in being Jew? Oh, you bet there was. Why? Because they had the oracles of God. They had the word of God. No other nation had that. God watched over his word and he gave it to them. Here were the Pharisees. They probably memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy by the time they were 12. They knew the scriptures. They had them. The religious leaders... The elders, all these people are here in this time. And they're the ones that are supposed to have had the people ready so when Jesus came, they received him. Now the people are receiving him, but the people who were supposed to lead him weren't. They weren't received. They wanted to kill him. It's the opposite. Let's get rid of them. And they're looking for a way to arrest him. And after all this, obviously they were upset. And then in verse, um, well, we won't read it for sake of time, but... Um, they remember they came up to Jesus right after. Remember, he just cleared the temple. Now they're coming up to him the next day, Tuesday, the day that we're looking at their attack on Jesus. Um, they wanted to catch him again in something he said. They said, or they, they wanted to catch Jesus. They said, what authority? Who gives you this authority? Who are you? You know, I'll call it my house. We've been here since we were young. We've been old. We've grown up and things are going the way we want. Now you're up scuttling the whole thing and, and saying it's your house. You cleaned it out. He messed up their plans. They didn't like it. Who gives you this authority? What does Jesus say? I love to listen to what he, he's got to say in these things. He says, I will ask you a question. I'm going to ask you guys a question. He doesn't have to answer your question. He doesn't have to answer my questions. You know, there are, there are questions we have. Sometimes they're not important. But I think the one big one is it, that we can ask is why, and God doesn't have to answer that. There are times we can ask him questions. If it's written in the word, if it's plain, it's, yeah, it's revealed truth. Yes, we need to know that, and we seek it out. But there are times we have questions in life. Why, why, why? He doesn't have to answer. He didn't hear so I'm going to ask you a question. Then in the end, he says, they couldn't answer it. So he said, well, I'm not telling you by what authority. He could have been easy. But he's saying that's not important. And a lot of the why questions we're going to have is, why did this turn out like this? And why did that happen? Whatever. We could be wasting our time for years and years putting our energy into something that's not even important. Um, uh, like sinking a Saul, chasing David. David's running from Saul. He, David did nothing but try and help Saul. But Saul's getting jealous. It's, I guess this is kind of the same picture here. Well, David's going to be the next ruler. We don't want that. He wants to hang on to the kingship and him for his son, Jonathan. And so David, once they'd fallen out of favor in Saul's eyes, Saul just got jealous. You know, and went chasing him. David said, Saul, you know, when he actually had a chance to speak and defend himself a little bit, he says, Saul, why are you chasing the flea? <laughs> here's Saul with all the resources of, of, of the kingdom and he's using them out to chase a flea spending all his energy in the wrong direction and, and the Pharisees were doing this too they were looking for self credit and whatever and, and you know there's times and questions we have and it just doesn't need to be answered and I love Joshua in the Old Testament I think it was Joshua and he's sitting there next thing the angel of the Lord comes by he's got a sword in his hand he's getting ready for the big battle he's got a sword in his hand Well, he asked a good question, I thought, you know. He asked the angel of the Lord, he says, whose side are you on? Are you on our side or for our enemies? Neither. <laughs> God, that's a question you have to answer. He doesn't have to answer that. And then he tells him and he puts, puts him in his place. He says, you know what? He says, as captain of the Lord of hosts, I've come. In other words, I'm in charge. Take your feet, your sandals off, because, you know, the place where your foot is is holy ground. 
You don't need to know that question. It doesn't matter. I'm in charge. And this is what's happening here. I'm, God's in charge. This is his house. But they're not recognizing it. They don't see it. Um, how often it's like that. You know, we ask questions that God doesn't think it's important to answer. Jesus had told Peter, Peter, when you're old, somebody else is going to clothe you and lead you where you don't want to go. He was speaking about the death that Peter would die. Well, Peter, I mean, he's got friends around him. You know, what about John over here? You know, if this is what's going to happen. What, what about John? And Jesus says, you know what? If I want John to stay here till I come back, what's that to you? <laughs> you know, in other words, it's none of your business. And then he says, Peter, Peter, you follow me. You follow me. So it's not our business to find out, well, why is God doing this to him or that to that? You know, who cares? You follow me. And that's the whole point of it. And he's saying that to the leaders here. You guys, you know what? You follow me. I remember we have a picture of him downstairs, Ray Paul, no? on, on the, um, who is always trying to teach by way of parable. <laughs> but we're having a meal up in his house there in Santander on third floor. Having dined, eating. He's got a window right behind him. Anytime there's an empty bottle in plastic, he'd take it, put the lid on, toss it out the window, without even looking, toss it out the window behind him. Something else would be emptied, and take it out, toss it behind him. Most people learn to ignore it, but others know that he's going to keep doing that until you tell him or ask him why. So this girl says, now, all right, Ray, why would you throw the bottle out the window? He says, I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell, or God tells me when I ask why. None of your business. None of your business. <laughs> and it's like that in these things. We got a lot of why questions we don't need to ask. Don't let let them fall off. Like like Job, man. All these questions. He was he was ready. God, I got a loaded gun, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you all these questions when I get my chance in court. And after God begins to speak, pretty soon he says, "I'm putting my hand to my mouth, man. This is not." It's not good. All those things I thought was so important just fade away. You know, like ashes fall into the ground in the fire. It's just, it's unimportant. We're to be taken up with the things of God. So this question about Caesar here wasn't really the big issue. He was saying, give God what's his. Give him your life. Isn't that his? All of us breathe, right? We're all taking breath. Now, since the day we were born, got our first breath, we're only here today because it keeps happening. And until I probably brought it up again this morning, you probably weren't even thinking about breathing. Now you are. <laughs> but every breath we take is a gift from God. And it's, it's his because he has us by ownership, right? We can't take credit for our first breath. We can't take credit for our last. If you try and hold your breath, eventually you're going to let go and start breathing again. God controls that. Our lives are in his hands. And he's saying, now, whose image are you? You know, whose image is on you? It's God's. And now let's give God back what's his. In other words, our very lives, our hands, our feet, our heart, our will, it's all his. Whose image is on us. Okay. Quickly here. Let's go to chapter 12. Then he began to speak to them. Now remember who them is again. It's the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the elders. All the big hobnobs, we said. All the big shots. A, pair, a man planted a vineyard, and he put a wall around it, and dug a pit for the wine press, and he built a watchtower. And he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent the servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck him, the man on the head, and treated him shamefully. He sent them still another, and that one they killed. He sent them many others, and some of them they beat, and others they killed. This is a parable, and he's aimed it right at them. And he's talking about this vineyard. Well, look at a vineyard. Without taking too much time to look at it, we know that Jesus sent the people in his day to need prophets. Some they mistreated. Most of them they didn't listen to. 
And here comes to the fulfillment of all things when Jesus is here, and we know they're going to kill him in three days' time. And he had one left, and he left to send a son whom he loved. We all know who that is. I don't need to explain that, do I? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? This is Jesus. He sent him last of all, saying they will respect my son. But the tenants and some of the other said one to another, this is the heir, come let us kill him, and his inheritance will be ours. And so they took him and killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. And now what happened to Jesus? Crucified outside of the vineyard. And what then will the owner of that vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes and they look for a way to arrest him because he'd spoken this, they knew that he had spoken this parable against him. And they were afraid of the crowd and they left him and went away. So here's the picture, and this is what is leading up to that question. They did not, they knew it was directly aimed at them, this parable of the vineyard. Because the vineyard represented God's people, and especially Jerusalem. I'm not making that up. Where do I get that from? How did they know in his day that he was talking specifically to them as leaders of the people? How did they know? Let's go find out what says what they said in their Bible. So let's turn to Isaiah. And they knew that this is what Jesus was referring to when he spoke this parable against them. Isaiah chapter 5. Called the Song of the Vineyard. Isaiah 5 verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it. He cut out a wine press as well, and he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? Good question. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for grapes, good grapes, it did yield only bad. And I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. See, whose is it? My vineyard. Why? Because he dug it up. He built a wine press. He planted a choice vine. He gave the patriarchs, you know, the, 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 the fathers of, of, of Israel. Abraham was a friend of God, a man of faith. And this was the heritage, and this is the vine that God had planted here. And it was to produce good fruit. And it wasn't doing that, only bad. So this is what's going to happen. I will tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow up there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Okay, so we're wondering who that vineyard is that Jesus has given him the parable about. He says it's it's Jerusalem. Uh, he looked. What what more could that? As he dug it out, as he cared for it, as he put a hedge around it to protect it. Think of their history. I mean, there's a psalm that says he brought the vine out of Ezer and he planted it. In the land, and it grew over the mountains. It said, you know, and the roots and the shoots spread out to the great river. Israel had prospered. This vineyard had a great location. Things were going good. Now he says, What more could I have done for my vineyard than I've done for it? You judge. He said, You guys judge. Is it my fault? And there's a verse in Jeremiah that says that, and that where God says, You know, what wrong have I done? 
that you turned so far from me. Can we ever blame God for something? There again, back to that why question. If people get awfully upset with God and it's his fault, this or that, and they'll be bitter against him till the day they die as far as they're concerned because God didn't whatever. Um, what fault do you find in me? God says, what, what more can I do than I've already done for my vineyard? Here he is, he planted it, he got it ready, and it was supposed to get ready for his coming. He comes back to Jerusalem, and here he is right near the end of his life, and they're ready to kill him. Something's wrong with the picture. It's, it's not the vineyard that he planted. They won't give him some of the fruit. Isn't that what the parable says back in Matthew? He came and said to get some of the fruit. He wouldn't going to take all, but just give him. He's the owner. Isn't he entitled to some of the fruit? And they wouldn't give him a grape. What? You know, they wouldn't have one measly little grape anyway if God hadn't planted the vineyard there in the first place. You know, back to our breath. You know, we wouldn't have one if God hadn't given it to us and how we live our lives and what God expects back from us, being made in his image. So he has that right to our lives because by creation, he has created us and made us in his image. And two, he has bought us back, bought us back by his death on the cross. And like I say, this is just, he's, it's the same thing happening. Israel went into captivity. It's going to happen here if they don't take his, heed his call. They were not going to exist as a nation if the very people that God had prepared for them were not willing and they would reject the cornerstone. If you've got no cornerstone, the building's not going to stand. And he said, you've got one of two choices. He says, you can make him your corner. The people, the experts that were supposed to know, you know, they're builders. They know this is a good stone. This is going to make the cornerstone. Yeah, let's build on it. And things would have been fine. But they didn't. They rejected him. He says, whoever lands on this stone will be broken. Whoever the stone falls on is going to be crushed. So you don't have a choice. Either he's a cornerstone or you're doomed. And this is what happened. They chose, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go in my own way. Let's, let's look at uh, some of the things Jesus said. If you look in, well, I guess we'll maybe just instead of looking, we'll just talk about it. some of the things that Jesus did. Now, in the passage that follows this, and especially in the book of Matthew, Jesus gave up some scathing woes to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He says, woe unto you hypocrites, Pharisees, teachers of the law. And he goes on some scathing remarks about them. He says, outside, you're all white and pretty. You know, you're like, you're, but you're a tomb. Inside, you're only full of dead bones. You're supposed to be leading the people. And he says, you go over land and sea to get one convert. And he says, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. And, I mean, he wasn't gentle with them. Uh, he, he was showing them where it, where it was at. And after all these scathing woes, you know, this woe unto you, woe unto you, he's trying to get them back, right? And he ends up this passage, this whole passage of after the woes and that. Is it because God was, was um, angry with them, wanted to do them away? No, his arms were always open, but they wouldn't have it, right? So he finishes off to this by saying, you know, to his vineyard, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, you know, how long would I have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not? Then he says, your house will be left to you desolate. Your house. Wasn't Jesus there for his house? He says, my house should be called a house of prayer. This is Jerusalem. This is the temple I made. This is where you were supposed to tell everybody about me and get people ready. We're standing here. This is my house. They wouldn't have it. After attack, after attack, after attack, they wouldn't have it. So finally Jesus said, I long to gather you like a chip, but now he calls it your house, doesn't he? You don't want me to live in your house? Well, then it's your house. And that's the way it says, by right he owns us, whose image is on us. Uh, we belong to him. Whether we want to or not, he's owner. And he wants what's best for our lives. And what he wants and what we do, young people, old, whatever, we give him our whole life. Our hands, our feet, our soul, our will, our all. And what can you do? What do you got to lose then, you know? Then we are in the full reason for why Jesus created us and made us as individuals in the first place. You can't lose by doing that. 
You know, I mean, well, if God would do this or that, the Bible says already, you know, what more can I do for my vineyard than I've done? You know, what, what more do you want Jesus to do? He's done, he's done it all. He, he not only made you, gave you breath, but he gave up his very own life to die on the cross two days, three days later for you and for me. And he died on the cross, rose again on the third day, and here we are this morning worshiping our creator. Um, he, he is in charge. He is in control. This is his house. Our bodies are his temple, and say, whether we want it to be or not, it is. We belong to him by right, but he has died. He's not going to force anybody. But there's the two destinies again. You have it. You know, it's either my house or your house. He's either the cornerstone or it's the stone that's going to crush us. I mean, it either, there's no other way. And he's made it plain and well. He doesn't have to do anymore. He's done it all. Didn't he say, it is finished? Well, I mean, what, what more can he do? What more can he say than to you he has said? So anyway, let's... Um, just the big picture is, you know, that this is his vineyard and it's a type. Now it affects us today too, doesn't it? I mean, we can take, I know he was talking to Jews, but the Bible has application for us too, doesn't it? This passage talks to us because he says he give his vineyard to others. Isn't that what happened? Other nation came in. What happened because Israel didn't believe the Jewish people? So they were cut off. But thank God you and I are grafted in, right? The vineyard was given to others. Now, if I can say it without twisting it, you know, we are the others. And and that's another sense. You know, God has entrusted us with his word. Now, we have kind of stand in the same place as the leaders did back then because what advantage did they have? They had the word of God. Now, we've got it. So, but with it comes a great responsibility. I mean, we've got, I don't know how many Bibles we could have in our home. Now we got it in our iPhones. We, we got it wherever. So with that comes a responsibility that we're to, to raise ourselves so that we bear fruit to God. So our, you know, families, so that vineyard is growing and producing good fruit. And the only way it's going to happen is if he's the cornerstone. Because if he's not and we're in charge, then we know things go haywire, which it did for the, the nation of Israel here. What more could he do? For his vineyard. And you know what more can God do apart from giving his life? There is nothing else, you know. Everything is a bonus. And yet he lavishes, doesn't he? He lavishes his love on us. Behold what manner of love the Father has shown, given to that he should, uh, I have that verse, too, I can't remember. Just come, but he lavishes his love on us, that we should be called the sons of God. So why don't we just close in prayer. Um, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the day that you've created. Thank you for putting us in it. And thank you for your word that gives us life. Lord, help us to receive from you what you want us to to receive, Lord. Help us to bear fruit, Lord, unto you. And to give you back what's yours anyway. Um, Take our lives and let them be consecrated to you. Uh, Our moments, our days. Just take us and use us for your glory, Lord. We want to be servants of the living God. And we want to have you in your right place so that things fall in the right place. And uh, just pray that you'll help us to follow you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.